Well, certainly, again, it's good to have everybody here. If you're visiting, we want to invite you to be back with us uh, anytime that you can, and it's always a privilege for me to share in God's Word with you. And as you might expect this morning, I'm going to be bringing a Father's Day message. I want to, this morning, just briefly look at some of the characteristics of a godly father. The song that, that Tony played, I thought, went really well with what we're going to study this morning, and and how important it is in the world that we live in today because the assault that we see on motherhood, the same assault is taking place on fathers. And our society is trying to change that definition of a father and a mother. God's definition has never changed, never will change. Father always has been and always will be a man. He always has and always will be the head of the household. And he always has and always will be the member of the family who's tasked with the spiritual teaching and upbringing uh, of his family. In society, when it allows the destruction of the basic premises of family, it is doomed to collapse. And we have to remember that. That's why it's so important to fight for our, our family structure. That's why it's so important that we as men uh, take on that responsibility that God has ordained us with. Uh, from the time that we become a father. So this morning, if you would turn in your Bibles over to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3, as we'll look at the godly father, the godly father. In Proverbs chapter 3, the writer says in verse 11 and 12, he says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. So discipline. And oftentimes we think about dads as being the, the heavy, the one that does the discipline. I remember as a kid growing up, some of the most dreaded words I could ever hear was wait till your dad gets home. And uh, I've heard that a few times. Not that mom couldn't give a pretty good spanking, but dad had it down to an art, I think. So, But it is important that we as fathers do discipline our children because God, our heavenly father, disciplines us. And for the same reasons, you want that discipline to take place because you love the child. And you know whatever the child, the path of the child or whatever the activity is doing is something that needs to be changed and something that needs to be corrected. And here we see he's talking about the chastening of the Lord, but also as a father in whom the son whom him delighteth. I mean, he, he raises him, corrects as he seeks fit. So that's why it's important for us to be men of God, men of faith, so that we can have godly correction for our children. Uh, God will chasten us and discipline us, and we must, as fathers and mothers, discipline our children. If you turn on over to Proverbs chapter 20, for whatever reason, I didn't put a slide in for this, but Proverbs 20, verse 7, we're going to see about influence. Now, I've got some real interesting figures here from some surveys that goes along with this as well. 20, verse 7, talking about influence, says, The just man walketh in his integrity, and his children are blessed after him, encouraging us as fathers to walk with integrity so that our children will be blessed. Now, have you ever thought about it that way, men? That when the, the walk that we take can affect how our children are blessed by our presence. And that's important. We may not sometimes think about the great influence that we have as fathers, but the fact is that children will follow after the father more than we as men may uh, actually... Uh, give ourselves credit for. Uh, we've heard the saying, just like, just like his father or father like son kind of thing. And fathers do, in fact, have a great deal of influence on, this, on the family and especially the children. And that's a great responsibility, men, that we carry. We should strive to be the best example that we could be. And we should also do that knowing that our children will follow in that example. When, and here's some figures for you. I was actually kind of shocked. I was selling a short, fellas, okay? Uh, but here's some important figures. When a dad attends church regularly, 67% of the children 
as adults will attend church. If a mother does not go to church, but the father does, again, right along that same line, about 63% of the children will end up attending church. If the father does not go to church, but the mother does, 63% of the kids will not attend church. So that shows uh, Sunday school's the same way. Uh, when both parents attend uh, Sunday school uh, service, 72% of the kids attend Sunday school. When only the father attends, 55% of the kids will attend. When the mother only attends, 15% of the children attend. When grown, that is as, as adults. And when neither parent attends Sunday school, only 6% of the children will attend Sunday school as grown adults. And then the final uh, little survey about, uh, and it's much like the first, is uh, for the child, when the child is the first person in the household to become a Christian, there's a 3.5% probability everyone in the household will follow in that child's footsteps. If the mother is the first to become a Christian, there's a 17% probability that everyone else in the household will follow. And this is getting ready to blow your mind, guys. When the father is the first to become a Christian in the household, there is a 93% probability everyone else in the household will follow his example. A lot of responsibility then. Kids follow our examples because that's the way God set it up. And if we find no value in a relationship with God, and this is a harsh way of saying it, most likely your child will find no relationship with God. Small percentage of it. If we don't bring our kids to Sunday school, very small percentage of kids will come to Sunday school and bring their children to Sunday school. So that's why it is so important, men, that we attend church. I'll just leave that there for you to, to wallow around in. Because we are imitated, much like the last. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, if you will. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, we are imitated. says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. I remember some time ago, you know, we, we talked about Paul was encouraging the church here at Ephesus to be imitators of God just as dear, dear children. We all can probably remember some commercials that showed the child trying to imitate the father, doing whatever as best that they could to imitate the father. And that's true. They imitate how we act. Not only, I'm not even just talking about the scriptures, about coming to church, about Bible study, about prayer, how we act and interact and treat other people. Our children will imitate us. So what do we want our children to imitate of us? You think about that. I want, I want my kid, I want Jared to imitate everything good about me, okay? And I want him to have amnesia and forget everything bad about me. That's my hope. But many times it don't happen that way, does it? And that's what we have to understand. I'm not saying we're expected to be perfect, not have any faults, not have any failures, not have any stumbles. But we should strive with that example knowing that we have to improve ourselves so our children won't have to fight that same battle. So we're imitated and we have to be remembered, be re brought to mind. We also should be men of compassion. And I know that sounds like something not associated with a manly man, okay? But compassion. If you turn over to Luke uh, chapter 15 in verse 22, it comes to the end of the story of the prodigal son as he returns in uh, from spending all of his inheritance early and, and going and wallowing with the hogs and, and wasting in, uh, away all of that resources that he has. And, and what does dad say to him when he comes back, uh, when he sees him afar off? Does dad say, I can't wait to get him here to light him up and let him know how wrong he was? Verse 22, Luke 15. But the father said to his servant, bring forth the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. 
Sounds pretty compassionate to me, doesn't it? You? Think about that? So yeah, dad probably had plenty of plenty of bases to really uh, tear down his son. But what good would it have done to tore down somebody that was already torn down, beaten, living in the, in the squalor of a hog pen, wishing that he had the food of his dad's servants instead of having to eat out of the hog trough to starve? That's not compassion to me. That's cruelty. But what we see in this example here is where he is so happy to see his son who was once dead to him because he was gone. And now he had returned and the joy had filled his heart so much he wanted to give his son, even though his son did not treat him the best, he wanted to treat him so, his son the best and display that compassion. So that's what we have to do then. We have to be compassionate fathers as well. May not fit the world. A manly moniker, but it's certainly godly. And I'd rather be godly than worldly any day. So uh, we're imitated. We're supposed to show compassion. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 9 through 10 will show that we are to train up faithfully, faithful training for our kids. 12, verses 9 and 10. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now this pleasure means how the Father sees fit, the fleshly Father sees fit. Trained by our fathers the best way that we can, kind of what I was talking about there, just a second ago. And we know that, uh, and we've heard out of Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, train up a child in the way that he should go, and when they are old, what? They will not depart from it. Now, what did the survey say that I just read out? We're talking about all of those being adults, okay? That proves that scripture. Not that anything God's, in God's book needs to be proven, but it shows that the statistics show what God's word said is true, that if you train up a child in the way that they should go, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Now, all of us probably at one point in time, when we were younger, probably experienced a little period of rebellion where we didn't go to church, where we were our own person, moms and dads included here, where we did what we wanted to do, was not going to be under the influence of mom and dad, be made to do something that we didn't want to do necessarily. But now that we are a little older, look where we're sitting today. Now that you're older, that results of that survey, you're proof of that as well. Because where are you? You're in a church. You're worshiping. You have a relationship, I hope, with the Lord. So training up that child is a direct call to us as fathers and parents to bring our kids up in a godly manner. Teaching them about the Bible, bringing them up to worship, and teaching them how to worship and eventually build a relationship with Christ. And not be too discouraged when they rebel, just like most of us all did at one point. But be in prayer for that. And trusting that what God's word says to train up a child in the way that he should go, and when they were old, they would not depart from it. So that's what we have to work toward. And then finally, we inspire. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. As you know how we exhort and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. So here Paul is using the actions of a father to relay how his relationship with his church at Thessalonica was. And it should be no different for us in our homes. We should encourage, lift up, comfort our children. Uh, and they need it in the world we need, we live in today. More so, dads, we probably, and moms too, really, we probably have a tougher time raising kids today than our parents did us and our grandparents did our parents. Because the outside influence, the attack that's going on 
to godliness, the attack that's going on to, to God's creation, the attack that's going on to just saying that man and woman is what? We didn't deal with that, did we? But our kids are, our grandkids are. They're being inundated from all sides and chastised because they believe what the Bible says is true. So we've got to be their best cheerleader at home. We've got to be teaching them and encouraging them. And if we don't use the Bible as fact, then here's what we do. We turn their minds over to the world. We turn our, their minds over to people that says a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man. Now, that's, do, is that what we want for our kids and our grandkids? Or do you want the truth of God's word, the truth of nature? Because they're denying even creation whenever they say that you can be some other gender. Whenever they say that there are, that it is all about how you identify, and the list is endless. You know, it just was two or three, and now it's a dozen or more uh, genders that you can be identified with. God created two genders, a man and a woman. Male and female, he says in the scriptures, created he them. Whose mind do we want? Who do we want to guide our children's mind? God or the world? that says that you can be whatever you want to be. I think it's pretty important that we inspire our kids, that we be a cheerleader for them, that we bring them to church, we bring them to vacation Bible school, we bring them to Sunday school, because we need to get all of the God's truth into them that we can before we kick them out into that mess. So that they'll have a strong basis so that they can stand firm and not be influenced by that. And it's important. And these six traits, men, that we've looked at this morning about the godly father, discipline, influence, how we're imitated, how we should show compassion, how we should provide faithful training, and how we should inspire. That's what that song was talking about. We want our kids to see a man of God so that they can imitate a man of God for their or, or young men. And we want those girls, you, dad, you, you girl daddies, but we want to see strong men in their lives so that they can pattern a husband in the future after a strong Christian man in their life. It's so important. It's a big responsibility that we have, men, and I encourage you, and I want to be your cheerleader today. I want to encourage you to, to be that man of faith, be that man of God. Set the, set the tone, set the example for your family to follow, and you're going to mess up, and, and that's okay because we're human. But as long as you pick yourself up and dust yourself off and you head back down that path and you strive to be the best Christian father you can be, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. It really will. So this morning we've looked at just a few traits of the godly father. There are many more that we could see, that we could reference this morning. But the best example that you can set for your children, whether they're little teenagers or even maybe young adult children is by accepting Christ as your Savior and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide you in your life. That's the best example you can set. Hearing and believing, confessing Christ as your Savior, repenting of your sins and being buried with Him in baptism, receiving the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit and being raised at new creation and moving forward. Trying to lead, be the best dad, be the best mom you can be, and waiting until Christ returns or work all the way in death. Now maybe you've done those things, but you realize, you know what, I've kind of slipped on my, on my duties as a parent, and I need to rededicate myself, and, and there's no better time than today to do that, and pick up and move on from there. And try to be the best influence on your kids that you can be, or the grandkids, or your nieces, or or nephews, and it doesn't matter because all of the kids today need that support. We have no idea the, the, the problems children face today in our schools, whether it's elementary, high school, or even college. They need the support of godly parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles, and be that good influence on their life. So if you have a decision to make today, I want to encourage you. We're going to sing... Uh, the hymn of invitation is I Must Tell Jesus 171 in your hymnals. We're going to sing the third and the fourth verse.
And I want to encourage you, if you have a decision to make, to come as we stand and sing.